Hi again everyone. In this video we're going to discuss line integrals and flux in the plane. Now the flux or, or the outward flux or the flow rate of a vector field over a closed curve in the plane has important applications to fluid flow. So we're going to work through the following example. We've got an ellipse and we're asked to do two things. We're asked to compute an outward pointing normal vector n to the, the ellipse and we're also given a vector field and we're asked to compute the outward flux of the vector field over the closed curve. So firstly let's um, first of all describe the ellipse using a vector function of one variable. Now there are various ways for computing a normal vector to a curve. I'm going to show you one way involving the cross product today. So you can think of my badly drawn ellipse here. This is the points that we're interested in and what we're chasing is some vector n that is sort of uh, normal to any tangent line or tangent vector to the curve. So what I'm going to do is show you a way to produce that using a cross product. Now every point P on the ellipse has a position vector associated with it. Now to form this vector for any point T, uh, for any point P on the curve, what I'm going to do is introduce a vector function of one variable. So then I can use the following to describe um, all the points that make up my ellipse. Now, how, how did I do that? Well, x equals 2 cosine t, y equals sine t. Just substitute in here for, cos, uh, for x and y, and you'll see that this ellipse equation holds. So this is actually um, what's known as a parameterization for my, for my ellipse. Now, essentially, I, I want the whole ellipse, so I do one rotation. That would mean that my t values go between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, think of this vector here as my position vector of P. What I can compute is this tangent vector to my curve. Okay, so to compute that, all I do is I differentiate the component functions of my R of T. So if I differentiate 2 cosine t, I'll get minus 2 sine t. If I differentiate sine t, I'll get cosine t. Now, think now of, of the z, the positive z-axis coming out of the screen at you. So I'm sort of working in three-dimensional space here. I want to compute n. I know what this tangent vector is. If I use the cross product and the right-hand rule, then I can essentially form this end in the following way. See this finger is pointing in the same direction as my R dash. If I cross it with a vector pointing in the same direction as my middle finger, then the right hand rule says this, this crossed with this gives me a vector pointing in the direction of my thumb. Now look at the, look at the direction of my thumb, it's in the same direction as the normal vector. So what can we use uh, choose this vector to be, well, the simplest vector that's pointing upward from the xy plane, the, the k vector, the vector 0, 0, 1. So, so let's form, uh, sorry, it's not, it's not necessarily a unit vector. So let's form n via the following cross product. It's going to be
this. Okay, this vector crossed with this vector gives me the vector pointing in the direction of my thumb. All right. Now, if I wanted here, I want an outward pointing normal vector. If I wanted an inward pointing normal vector, I would just switch the um, uh, order of these things. Okay, so R prime is minus 2 sine t, cosine t, and we're just working the xy plane here, so 0, k is 0, 0, 1. Okay, so to expand this, what I can do is just expand along the top row. So let's start with i. Cover up the row and column that i is in and multiply i by the determinant of what's left. So the determinant here would be this times this minus this times this, so cosine t. Okay, minus, let's move on to j. j is in this column and this row, let's cover those up. Multiply j by the determinant of what's left. So, work diagonally, minus 2 sine t times 1, minus 0 times 0. So, I actually get the following. And if I just cover up the, the k with the um, appropriate column and row, then look at the determinant of what's left, it's 0. So if I just write this in terms of, um, say, an ordered triple, this is what I have. Okay, so this then, or this, however way you want to write it, is my outward pointing normal vector. Now why is that important? Well, it can be important in part B, depending on um, how you want to calculate these things. So in part B, I'm given a vector field and I'm asked to compute the outward flux over my ellipse. Okay, well how do I do that? Well, there are a couple of ways and, I, and I'll show you both ways. So this is like solution part one. So the flux, or the outward flux, is the following. It's a line integral, and essentially it's the normal component of f that is integrated around the curve c. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's just draw part of the curve here. At each point, I'm going to have a unit normal vector. Now this vector that we calculated up here isn't necessarily a, a unit vector, but here we've got a unit normal vector, an outward pointing unit vector, a unit normal vector. At every point I'm going to have some value for my f, and then if I just draw a little triangle, right angle triangle, the length of this side here is the, com the, comp the normal component of f. So what this says is that the outward flux is just this length integrated around the curve c with respect to the arc length. Okay, so how do we compute that? Well, there's a number of ways of doing that. So let me just show you um, the first way. Essentially, we've parameterized our curve. And we can replace ds with the magnitude of this dt. And what's n hat? Well, from up here, we know that n hat is r dash crossed with k. Now, if I wanted to make this a unit vector, I would just divide by the magnitude of r dash. So, if I sort of, essentially, if I divide this by r dash, uh, the magnitude of r dash, then I'm going to get some, and put it in here, I'll get some cancellation. So, essentially, what I'll have is the following.
okay? So we computed this part in part A, all we have to do is compute this part. So our vector field here is 4xi plus yj, or 4x comma y. Let's go up there and replace x with 2 cosine t and y with sine t. And we'll be integrating from 0 to 2 pi. So I'm going to get cosine t and sine t dotted with this. And we computed that in part A. So that is just cosine t to sine t dt. So let's consider this. When I expand, I'm going to get a cosine squared. 8 cosine squared t plus 2 sine squared t. And when I integrate those two things, well, if I integrate cosine squared, I'm going to get, uh, from 0 to 2 pi, I'm going to get pi. So this is actually going to give me 8 pi. When I integrate sine squared from 0 to 2 pi, I'm going to get pi again. So actually my answer is 10 pi. That's one way of doing it. Note that you know, we, we really had to compute this, um, this normal vector here through a cross product. Now that's not always necessary, so let me show you another way of doing this problem um, without the need for uh, a normal vector. Well, if I parameterize my curve C in an anti-clockwise fashion, so as T increases, the curve gets traced out in an anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction, then I can use the following. Okay. So note this little arrow here. It's going in an anti-clockwise direction. So M and N are just functions. of two variables and um, essentially for our problem the m was 4x and the n was y. So how does this help, em, help our, um, our calculations? Well there's no um, explicit calculation of the normal vector or unit normal vector there. Okay well Let's compute these differentials and essentially we want to evaluate m and n along our curve. So how do we do that? Well, we can use some um, of the calculations we've done before. Let's think about m evaluated along our curve. Well, that will just be this this function here, 8 cosine t. Now what about dy? Well, if y equals sine t, well dy equals cosine t dt. So essentially it's just that dt. Okay, n evaluated along the curve, well that's just this. So we've got sine t and dx, well that would just be, if x equals 2 cosine t, dx is just that, dt. So if I sort of bring the t dt's um, uh, out to the right hand side, you can see here hopefully that, actually I've got 8 cosine squared plus 2 sine squared. And that's exactly what we had up here, so we get the same answer. So there's two ways of calculating the outward flux. Note that though, in here we're assuming that you've parameterized the curve so that it is swept out in an anti-clockwise anti um, direction. Well, what does it mean? What, we've got an answer of 10 pi here. What does it, what does it mean? Well, 
if this f represents, say, the, it's the velocity field of a fluid, then it would mean that there's a net outflow over the curve C. Okay, well, there's a, a couple of problems there. Let's look at the um, bigger picture. So suppose we have a closed smooth curve C. So by smooth, I mean the parameterization as a continuous derivative, and that derivative is never the zero vector. Uh, any normal vector to C may be produced by using this depending on whether you want it to be outward pointing or inward pointing and depending on your um, orientation. For some smooth curve C with parameterization R, an outward pointing unit normal vector, n hat, we can compute the outward flux over C by basically integrating um, f dot n hat over the curve C. Now, I've also shown you that if you parameterize C using this anti-clockwise um, um, orientation, then the line integral can be computed in the following way. Okay, here's some examples for you to try, very similar to the one that I've done. If you have a knowledge of double integrals, have a go at three. If not, don't worry about it. Um, remember, the, a, a, good, a way of getting good at mathematics is by doing lots of mathematics. So have a go at these questions and um, see how you go.